Hi, Nancy. Hi, Shane. How's it going? Good. Good. Uh, we're just we're getting straight into it today. So, um, are you familiar with the golden record that was on Voyager? Do these words mean things to you? I am. Uh, we actually have a book like detailing that. Don't ask. But yes, quite familiar. All right. So we're going to talk about this more, but like the the short of it is for those who aren't aware, uh, there's this record on the Voyager spacecraft that Voyager is like the farthest thing out in the universe right now that we've ever made. And people put things on this record, like images and, and audio and all sorts of stuff. So I was interested if you could choose, Nancy, one thing to go on the golden record, what would that thing be? Shane, is this not an obvious question? This podcast! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and the methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in the manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Nancy Bompey. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. Well, Nancy, I guess people are missing out, uh, or or not people, but extraterrestrials, if they come across Voyager, are missing we'll out. Never hear this this wonderful podcast. They'll never hear our we're lovely not voices. The golden record. <laughs> <laughs> but we are talking about the golden record today mm-hmm. because today is all about planetary science, and the golden record was on Voyager, uh, which you know is like the farthest thing that we've as humans have put out into the the universe. So I'm going to bring in our producers uh, for this episode, Katie Brundell and Liza Lester. Hi, guys. Hey. Hey. Um, Liza, so Voyager, huh? Yeah, Voyager. Launched in the 70s. There were two Voyager missions, and they showed us some of the first up close, you know, relatively up close views of these planets, Saturn and Uranus and Neptune and Pluto that are so far away. Um, I think you may remember also the pale blue dot, mm. the image that I it took that. Yeah. from Carl out beyond Sagan. Pluto, yeah. <laughs> looking so small. Yeah, and so it's it's uh, they've passed outside the solar system now, but they're still phoning home occasionally. Yeah, it's it's really interesting stuff too. And actually, last year Liza and I were able to talk to a planetary mm-hmm. scientist. Uh, she's been working on missions from Voyager in the late 1970s to New Horizons and also Juno which arrived at Jupiter in uh, 2016, I believe. And she uh, has this really fascinating career and had a front row seat for some interesting findings. So my name is Fran Bagnall. I'm at the University of Colorado in Boulder. I work in the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, where I work on um, several space missions, and right now, it's the uh, New Horizons mission to Pluto, following on to other areas in the Kuiper Belt, as well as the Juno mission that is in orbit around Jupiter. What is it like to be among the first on the planet to see this new data, these new photos coming in from these distant places? It's one of the most e- extraordinary experiences in life to do that, um, to, to see the first pictures, to get a sense of a whole new world. And, you know, every time you make predictions, and your predictions are always totally wrong, what you find <laughs> is completely different, and that's, it's, it's really amazing. I, I could give you an analogy that might be fun. I used to do some caving when I was a student at the University of Lancaster in Northern England. We go down these limestone caves, and sometimes we would explore new caves, maybe in Spain or Mexico. And uh, it's a bit like going along a dark passage in a cave. You're wearing a headlamp, and then you turn around a corner, and you see an amazing st- crystal structure, or you find a whole new pathway. And it's the same sort of thing. It's like, wow, look at that. That's cool. How have results and findings from each of these missions helped inform subsequent missions? So we went from Voyager to the more recent ones, New Horizons, and Juno, and then looking ahead to, to the Dragonfly mission um, that was recently announced. How, how can you talk about the, or can you please talk about sort of the evolution of, of these missions? So there's a standard way of talking about it, which is to say the first thing you do is a flyby and get the basic ideas. And then you take a payload which sort of does big view. It sort of casts a wide net in the science that it might do because you really don't know what science you're gonna see. 
So you do your flyby. And then you say, okay, this is what we learned. These are the big questions. And now we need to go back with a more specific set of instruments. We're going to go into orbit, and we're going to go look for whatever, systematic variations of space and time, or go and do a detailed survey of something. So for example, after Voyager, we had Galileo going to the Jovian system. Houston now controlling. Roger roll, Atlantis. And the idea of the Galilean um, mission was to look at the moons, the four Galilean moons, and get multiple views of what they're like, which it did, indeed. And the Sunnyvale flight director has just confirmed the successful deploy of the inertial upper stage and Galileo. Uh, mapped out the volcanoes on Io. It, it looked at that, the ice on Europa and got us thinking. Maybe there's, and we learned that there's a ocean underneath water, a liquid water underneath the ice at Europa, that Ganymede has a magnetic field, mm -hmm. that Callisto's a bit kind of boring, poor Callisto, just an <laughs> impact crater. But you know, these different worlds, poor little Callisto. Anyway, we learned a lot, and then that raises some very specific questions. Roger, Atlantis, we copy. That's great news. Thanks. What do you think was so notable about Voyager? So the thing that's special about Voyager is the opportunity it had at a particular time with the lining up of the planets, this thing we call syzygy. Which is where all the planets are in the same quadrant of the solar system and it happens like every 130 odd years, something like that. And it happened to be in the uh, late 70s when this was happening. And so we had the opportunity to send a spacecraft out, get a kick at Jupiter, go on to Saturn, get a kick at Saturn, go on to Uranus and do the same out to Uranus and Neptune, and to go to the four big giant planets, one after the other. That's one amazing thing that happened at the right time. But this also happened when we had the capability to take a, a fairly sophisticated, for the time, spacecraft that could have cameras, that were very capable compared with previous ones, had recording systems and had an ability to um, make multiple observations through a whole variety of different instruments and send them back. And um, although the computer capability are pretty pathetic, your phones have um, many thousand times more computing capability than Voyager has, um, it was able to work and take these pictures, fly by, and show us and reveal these amazing new worlds, the moons around Jupiter, the rings uh, around Saturn and, and then Titan, uh, and then go on and for the first time go to Uranus and Neptune and explore those, those environments, which was just incredible. Was there anything you would have wanted to add to the golden record? The golden record is about us. Yes. You know, it's about us as a culture, as a world. What I think would be interesting would be to think about trying to sh tell a story of human evolution, of or of culture. I mean, it's very hard to think how to do that but we're sort of avoiding those topics, right? We don't, we don't really talk about cultural history mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. Um, maybe I'm more aware of this being a Brit coming. I've lived here now more years in America than I lived in England, but you know, I'm, it sort of makes you more aware of cultural backgrounds. Mm -hmm. That would have been kind of fun to put on. I don't know how you'd do it. Right. You probably wouldn't put it on a record, but you know. Modern technology, thumb drive. When Voyager was getting the first looks at some of these moons up close, up closer than we'd seen before, I mean, was it a surprise that they were so interesting? Indeed. I mean, you know, we did have a clue that EO was a bit peculiar because it triggered radio emission. We knew that since 1965. And we knew that it seemed to have sort of strange brightening features. And at some point we thought, oh, it looks like it has sulfur and oxygen coming off it and it has an atmosphere. We knew some of these things from spectroscopic studies from the Earth looking at telescopes, but they're just sort of little hints, little clues. From the Earth, these objects are still fuzzy dots. 
really no more than a fuzzy dot. So to fly by and go from a fuzzy dot to upfront geology, upfront atmospheric structure, upfront detailed issues of, of scientific discussion of the interior, the surface, the atmospheres, the interactions with the surrounding plasma, you know, you really move forward a huge amount when you actually get up close. Do you think seeing, just seeing those pictures really to catch the bug for planetary science then? Absolutely. Or was it already on, you were already on board? Well, I was already on board. When I was a kid, of course, uh, there were two big factors. One was, of course, the Apollo era, which affected a lot of people of my generation. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Watching people walking on the moon, and then there was science that they were doing, and we did hear about that science. But the other thing that's kind of exciting is that was a time when the Earth was being studied and plate tectonics was being discovered. And there was a lot on the British TV about what people were finding looking at the mid uh, oceans, looking at volcanoes, looking at trying to work out the magnetic field signatures and so on and so forth, and putting it all together and saying, wow, looks like the Earth has plate tectonics. And of course, I began to think, well, what do other planets have and what's it like in other places? I heard Carl Sagan and I actually was lucky to meet him when I was 16 and he gave a talk at Cambridge and I went to hear him talk uh, as a high school kid and, and he was talking about um, the Mariner observations at, um, or maybe it was Viking, I'm sorry, I can't remember, it was way back then. Voyager's passage by Jupiter accelerated it towards a close encounter with the planet Saturn. Saturn's gravity will propel it on to Uranus. And in this game of cosmic billiards after Uranus, it will plunge on past Neptune, leaving the solar system and becoming an interstellar spacecraft. Oh, I love Carl Sagan. That is definitely on our list to rewatch the original Cosmos. During the yeah, quarantine same here. Time. Yeah. So good. Such a good show. You know, and it was it was really compelling to talk to somebody like Fran, who has had this this bird's eye view of the different planetary missions going back 30 to 40 some odd years. And now she's really looking forward to the upcoming Dragonfly mission and, you know, what new things we're going to be able to to learn from it. I want to go back to 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 Dragonfly for a second. That our next New Frontiers mission, Dragonfly, will explore Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Dragonfly will be the first drone lander with the capability to fly over 100 miles through Titan's thick atmosphere. Titan is unlike any other place in our solar system and the most comparable to early Earth. What do you think that mission will help us understand and what are you most excited to potentially learn about from it? Uh, I'm not a Titan expert, um, and I've just been following. In fact, you know, when, when the Huygens probe landed on um, Titan, um, it was ejected, carried out there by Cassini, and then, then put it onto, into the atmosphere and onto the surface, we didn't know it was going to survive on the surface. I don't work in that area, but I took the day off, I went into the lab, and I went and, and spent the whole day watching NASA DV with the public and, and other people and getting engaged and watching it. It was so cool to watch this uh, probe going in and taking pictures of a landscape that looks the most terrestrial that I, I think we've got elsewhere in the solar system because you have sort of things that look like rivers, you have things that look like oceans, you have mountains, you have... have um, uh, sand dunes well they're not actually it's the sand is probably water or or some hydrocarbons and so on it's not the typical stuff but it looks almost terrestrial and so when the the probe came in and took these pictures getting closer and closer and then it landed on the surface and you saw this skate that sort of a bit like a, a really frozen utah <laughs> it was fantastic you know so, you know, I think what we'll do with Dragonfly is I think the plan is to fly over and get much better measurements across a range of places and, and actually get a, a more detailed sense of key, um, knowing the people involved, I'm sure they'll be picking very important key scientific targets and then going there and, and really trying to understand the physical processes. Because, of course, we want to understand how this object, which is a lot smaller than Earth with a thick atmosphere, with very different temperatures, how does the geology 
and the relationship between the interior crust and atmosphere work in relation to a place like Earth or Mars or Venus. Um, it's, it's, it's like a terrestrial planet in that respect, but often a, a far part of parameter regime. If you could go to one place in the solar system, what, where would it be and, and why? So I work in planetary magnetic fields and with charged particles. And so for that, um, the sort of mission we're doing at, uh, with Juno, where we're flying over the poles, we're going through the auroral region, we're measuring the charged particles and so on, um, is very important. Um, and I'd like to do that again at, at other places. Of course, Uranus and Neptune would be fantastic. Those are tilted magnetic fields with very bizarre changing magnetic orientation. Um, it would be great to go. I think the planet that is the most neglected is Venus, our sister planet, right? Very similar in size to Earth, extremely different in its properties. Why is it that this planet that's right next door mm -hmm. has such a different atmosphere, such a different surface, um, what is it about planetary evolution that led to Venus being too hot, Earth just right, and, and Mars too cold for life, liquid water on the surface? But also, how do these planets work? I'm going to ask a basic science question because we were just talking about magnetic fields and charged particles, and, and that is, um, why do some worlds have magnetic fields and others do not? It's a very good question as to why, particularly our sister planet, um, Venus does not have a magnetic field and the Earth does. And then why does this moon Ganymede have one, you know, uh, whereas none of the other moons that we're aware of have them? And uh, really, dynamo theory is very, um, it's difficult, difficult to model, difficult to generalize. Uh, it's the easiest way to say is you need three basic ingredients. You need a volume that is electrically conducting. And for the terrestrial planets, um, and for Ganymede, that is a liquid metal region in the outer core. You need a source of energy that will turn over and convect that region of liquid metal. Um, and that is, for the case of the Earth, it's thought to be the condensing out of heavier iron from a mixture of less heavy elements in the outer core. It's gravitational settling out of the inner core. Now, when you go to Jupiter, you don't have a metal core, nor do Uranus and Neptune. You have gases which are at sufficient pressure and temperature. So in the case of Jupiter, it's metallic hydrogen. Uh, oxygen, sorry, is, is settled it out, but mostly you have hydrogen and um, that is broken up into protons and electrons that can move relative to each other, and so you have a dynamo inside. Now, the third ingredient, one is conductor, second is uh, liquid conductor, second is a source of energy, the third is a little bit of rotation. But I understand that every single planet, even Venus, has enough rotation, even though Venus rotates very slowly. So rotation is not the problem with Venus. It may be that the outer core has solidified, or maybe, so there's no longer a liquid metallic region, or it could be that there isn't a source of energy to drive sufficient convection. Or thirdly, it could be the lack of plate tectonics is not cooling the outer layer because you need a temperature gradient, cold on the outside, warm on the inside, and maybe that is suppressing the convection deep inside. So these are just ideas we really don't know. What do you think is the plate tectonics level um, discovery that we're, we're looking at now? Or I guess the better question is... You mean at the Earth? Or, or, or at elsewhere. Or, or elsewhere. You know, it, what would be that level of question or theory? So for, for, for Venus, it's a real, we know that Venus, f from looking at the radar maps of the surface, that the uh, impact craters, distribution of impact craters, suggest there's fairly uniformly resurfaced something like 500 million, 600 million years ago, something like that. And so then comes the question, what was it like before that? Was it before that, just like the Earth, with plate tectonics and in, in just a regular Earth-like um, object, which then sort of solidified and stopped and stagnated, could be, or there was something else that led to 
Venus uh, not having convection and not having plate tectonics ever or never having a crust that could move around, or maybe water was important. A lot of people argue water plays a big role in lubricating, for want of a better word, the uh, Earth's plate tectonics. And if you don't have water on Venus because it was just a little bit too warm, then maybe it never really had plate tectonics. So in some ways, I think going back and looking at the Earth, sorry, going back and looking at Venus would be very useful and trying to find maybe put a lander that you could do some seismic test to find out what it's like inside. It wouldn't have to live for very long if you, you know, I, I don't know. It would be the lots of ideas of things that we could do. Yes, it's tough, but let's think of ways to do that. I know that we, there are missions going to Mars and we're going back to the moon. And so we seem to be going away from the sun, right? But I think it's really interesting talking about Venus. I feel like we don't hear a lot about science on Venus and studying it. Uh, And I imagine that stuff like this is only possible when we have interest from the public. Like you get more non-science or yeah, the non-science public interested in this type of thing. And that might actually help drive people's interests, scientists' interests in kind of the larger solar system outside of some of the planets we might hear about more often. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that Liza and I talked to Fran about. How can members of the scientific community, one, advocate for better funding uh, for the sciences? Also, how can we encourage more students to think about, be excited by, and actually consider and pursue degrees in science? The most important thing is we need to increase the number of teachers in schools, particularly high schools, who have a bachelor's degree in physics or other sciences, you know, earth sciences. You know, we need to do something about that. Um, Earth sciences, um, chemistry, biology, uh, math, physics, all of these areas. So the teachers need to be probably paid better. We need to be producing more bachelor's degrees, maybe working with the community colleges to do combined education and science degrees. I think we should actually change the name of physics to P-H-U-N, fun, and (laughs) and excite people to study physics. Um, I'm worried that whenever people say, mention the word physics or math, they go, oh, but I couldn't do math. I'm like, no, never say that, never say that. You know, we all struggle with it, and uh, we need to just, as a nation, be putting a lot more in energy and effort into schools, local schools, and in cranking up the science at the schools. So you can do that locally. What do you think it is that about physics that is discouraging women, or where is the problem in the pipeline? So we looked at this in the 80s, and, and the answer was that if you looked at... It used to be more in the high schools, but I think the problem now is at the colleges because it's sort of 50-50 at high school, women uh, and, and guys. And if you look at the, uh, at the colleges, that's where it drops to 20%. I think the problem is that the classes are large. I think that there's a, an attitude coming from high school that you need, just need to study on your own and you pass your homework. Once you get to college, you need to learn how to work together in a group. You need to do studying together. You need to make it social. The universities need to have study areas that are safe and comfortable and fun and um, pay juniors and seniors to be study buddies to come in and help the freshman and the sophomore get over that bump of how do I face up to this math and physics and having to do these homeworks and learn how to work together as a group and learn how to teach each other this material because it can be fun, it can be interesting. And um, yeah, the teachers need to learn to be a little less snooty, I'm a physicist, you know, and a little bit more friendly and uh, encourage the students to work together and work with other students um, on, on this fun projects. I guess that leads me to the question, at the time you were going through your schooling, you know, I'm sure you've been asked this many times, but like, what was it that encouraged you to continue? I think the reason uh, I, I stuck with it for a couple of reasons. One is because, yes, the British BBC, every Monday night there was a Horizon showing a documentary on science, and I just lapped it up and I loved it. Um, but also I was, uh, you know, I was feisty and I was persistent and I stuck with it right and and uh but you shouldn't have to be 
super feisty and super persistent in order to survive. You could just be an ordinary person. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it should be much more available to everybody and you shouldn't have to be this dogged persistent. How have you seen the representation of women in planetary sciences change over the past 30, 40 years? 40 years, yeah. It, it's improved. It's actually quite interesting. I went out for dinner with a couple of women who were on the Voyager team. As They were there as support for the science teams. And they did not at that time have degrees, but they were had some technical training and were employed by JPL to work in, on the operations side. And we were talking about how that was a way they could get in and work with the scientists uh, in a friendly way. And I think that the, the missions, because you have a variety of different ways of getting involved, um, tended to be more balanced. I was going to say, uh, do you know of any you know, stark differences in how maybe the subjects are approached? Yeah, well, I think it's a cultural issue. I think the problem is this. If you Google the word physicist, you will find that you'll get like 160 pictures of guys and maybe five women, you know? And and also, if you ask someone what a, a a physicist was or an astrophysicist was they would be talking about some you know much older white guy probably with hair sticking up um, <laughs> you know pontificating about astrophysics and black holes and the meaning of the cosmos and all this sort of stuff right if you ask somebody what a planetary scientist was like you'd have someone who's a lot more engaging more involved and that's part of partly history it's a cultural thing planetary science is new it's a very young field, and I think that that it's just reflects a more more modern cultural environment. Yeah, planetary science—it's like the gateway science. Well, it is really. I mean, think about it. You know, kids, what do they get interested in? Like dinosaurs. And then they get interested in like planets and stuff. So it is cool. And I really like Captain. Who are these kids? Who are these kids? These alleged kids. I don't. I never liked space. I like it now. I've come around. Some people do. (laughs) That's fair. Mm. (laughs) That's fair. But it gets people, I think, excited who aren't even that like science-y when you're like, we're going to send this rocket to this far off place. I think it, you know gets people excited and drive robots on another planet it's exciting what hasn't been explored in detail yet that you would most like to see and and learn about well apart from venus and uranus and neptune there is of course europa europa is the most likely place to find life in our solar system today because we think there's a liquid water ocean beneath its surface. And I do think it's a very important topic to try and understand how, if at all, the water from the deep ocean inside that may or may not have some form of life, we don't know, primitive or otherwise, um, how does that, if at all, couple to the surface? If it doesn't couple to the surface, then, you know, we're out of luck. Drilling down is a heck of a long way down to go. But if there is some way in which it couples to the surface, and we need to go and do these flyby missions, the Europa Clipper, to find out uh, where there may be connections between the deep interior and the surface uh, and g- get a sense of the better sense of the layout of the land. We have very crude sense of the geology of Europa, even though the Im- images look kind of cool. They're very low resolution compared with what we need to understand and go land there. Europa is so important because we want to understand are we alone in the cosmos? Ultimately, yes, it would be go great to go and scratch and sniff the surface and find out what that brown gunky stuff is. <laughs> is it is it whale poop? The, the, is it? I don't scientific know. term. Yes. yes. Well, if you're going to go look for life, the place to go is Europa. Forget chasing life on Mars. It's not going to be anything that wiggles, which is what people think when you say life. So if you want to find something that wiggles, go to Europa. I just wanted to ask you what you think it is about Pluto that is so lovable to everyone from all ages. Yeah, what is lovable about Pluto? 
And then when we it's do- small, it's out there, it's unknown, intriguing, and it was surprising when we got there. And it has these weird little moons that are going around. So, you know, I think all of that makes it very interesting. Great. All right. And Pluto loves his back, has the little heart. It has left a little heart. Yeah. We'll go back. We'll go back. I think it'll be cool. Nancy, do you have strong feelings one way or the other about Pluto? Positive? Negative? Well, I was kind of like meh on Pluto. No one's meh on Pluto. Oh, I know. That's not like, I guess I didn't have, I was like, "Mm." but then I went a couple years ago on New Year's Eve to the flyby of that object in the Kuiper Belt by, you know, New Horizons. And that was super exciting. And everyone was so excited. And Brian May was there and did a song. So that was so neat. All right, that yeah. that would that would no, leave me with it. some strong associations. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah. I I appreciate that. All right, folks. Well, that's all from Third Pod from the Sun. Thanks so much to Katie and Liza for bringing us this story, and of course to Fran for sharing her work with us. This episode was produced by Katie Brendo and mixed by Kayla Surrey. AGU would love to hear your thoughts. Please read and review us on Apple Podcasts. Um, you can get this podcast wherever you get your podcasts or always at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all, and we'll see you next time.